So our final presentation this morning, um, again, we have two speakers, and the title of their pres presentation is Mission Preservation, Bringing the Films of the Defense Visual Information Center to the Public. Our speakers are Audrey Amidon and Henry Heidi Holstrom, who are both preservation specialists in the Motion Picture Pres Preservation Lab at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, where they and their colleagues assess, preserve, and help to make accessible the archive's vast holdings of motion picture film. Heidi received a master's in history with a certificate in archives and records management from Western Washington University. She serves on the board of the American Baptist Historical Society and provides guidance in the care of their audiovisual collection. Audrey received a master's in film archiving from the University of East Anglia. She previously worked with the Donald McMillan Film Collection at the Perry McMillan Arctic Museum at Bowdoin College. So we welcome you. Hi, I'm Audrey. Um, you just heard a little bit about us from Mary Lynn. But as she said, we work in the Film Preservation Lab at College Park. And we do a wide variety of things from all ends, from, from the inspection to preservation in, in preserving and making accessible the motion picture records. This project we'll tell you about today is just a small piece of some of what we do, but it's something we've been working on for quite a long time. And hopefully, we would want you to leave today just understanding how our incoming inspection and technical assessment is the foundation for all future preservation decisions, and it ensures the long-term accessibility of, of our film records over time. Uh, we started working on this, the Defense Visual Information Center uh, accession in October of 2007, so it has been about five and a half years. We've been working on it around other projects, preservation, reformatting, other smaller accession projects. But you can see it there all hanging out in the stacks. What is DIVIC? You'll hear us mostly refer to this as DIVIC because I guess that's what we do in the government is we always have to have an acronym for everything. But it's the Defense Visual Information Center. Uh, it, it still exists in the military. It's called DIMOC now. I actually don't know what that means. But they produced instructional films and videos that were shown to military personnel. Our collection that we received is a mix of film and video. We'll be talking to you about the film because that's what we do. Video is handled in a different, a different lab. You can visit their table out in, in the, the hallway there. Um, the, the years covered are from World War II through the early 1990s. So we have things like the Combat Bulletin series, which is, is essentially, a, they were newsreels that were shown to military personnel. Uh, during World War II, giving small stories about developments in the war and different pieces of equipment, things like that. And we do have uh, videos that go up through the 1990s, the Persian Gulf War. The film collection, the film part of it, stops in the early 1980s. At that point, the military was making primarily videos for instructional purposes. The collection is different than the vast majority of our military footage. So any of the, you, know, you might see things on cable documentaries that show people in the jungle during Vietnam. Uh, the military was really good at documenting their activities. And we have thousands and thousands of reels of unedited footage of just showing what was going on. These are very specifically produced films that they created in order to teach their own personnel and that can be any number of things. Some of them might be kind of uninteresting to the general public, things like position and grip, machine gun M1919A6 on M2 tripod. So very specific, maybe not something interesting to you, but was absolutely essential for teaching people how to do their jobs. Some of them are more general interest, things like bayonet fighting or living off the land. Um, there are also, there's also a series of educational films that uh, depicted the history of a particular battle or a particular military unit, like the 4th Infantry Unit in Vietnam, things like that. Scattered throughout the succession, there were films with really intriguing titles that would get us excited, like things like The Lady is Shocked, which we thought might sound like a titillating exploitation film, but it was really just a film about underwater detonation tests that were done to determine the amount of shock that a naval vessel would absorb in cases of nuclear war or something like that. Um, so yeah, then 
I told you it was big, but you know, what did we receive? Well, that picture there is showing you about 5% of what we got as it was staged in the stacks for us to start working on it. Uh, Divic was a little bit different than most agencies in that when we received it, it was already really well organized, but we still had to go through this process of assessing it so that we could make sure that every, um, that all of the titles were handled correctly and that the most original elements were preserved and protected. Just a few numbers, because I like numbers, just to give a sense of what we had. We got 51 pallets from Divic, and that comes to about 40 tons. It's not how we usually measure our records, but it's a lot. Uh, we ended up with 2,700 different titles that were selected by the archival unit as being of permanent value to um, the nation's history. That's why we're keeping them. In that, um, separate from, you know, I said some of them were just video, but we ha ended up with 13,214 separate film elements. Each title would have multiple reels in most cases, um, and that ended up being about 10 million feet of film, which if you stretch those end to end, that would take you past Santa Fe. And of course, we would never do that with our film because that's not the way you properly handle it, but it's just to give you a sense of how much there really was. So Heidi. Okay, so after the film was taken in by the archival unit, um, they were sent down to the Motion Picture Preservation Lab. And lots of things happen in the Film Preservation Lab, ranging from technical assessment of the films to preser preservation reformatting. With DIVIC, we mostly only did inspection and technical assessment because the films were in such good condition when they came to us. We did some preservation reformatting and repair work as we found damage or deterioration in the film elements. We had to assess all 13,000 reels of film in order to make sure that our primary goal is accomplished, and of course our goal is protecting the original film elements and extending the life through proper storage and handling. And the films are not accessible to the public until the, accept the assessment work is done, because until that point we really don't know what we have. So. I can tell you a little bit about the assessment, which we also call film inspection. Each film gets handled hands-on by the film lab staff. We wind through the film from end to end and collect information about it. So we'll record data about what type of film element it is, whether it's negative or positive, or if it's sound or silent. We'll write down information about um, deterioration that we notice, both physical and chemical, and also stuff like the footage and the length of the film, just everything so that we can go back to this data, which is stored in a database, and when we get the film in the lab, we'll know what to expect when we open the film can and what we would need to do if we were asked to make a copy of it or any of the other things we would do in the lab. And assessment allows us to create our archival sets, and this is the most important step in ensuring the long-term survival of motion picture records. We have three different levels that we sort them into. There's the preservation set, and that's the best, most original copy of a film title, and we give that one the most protection. Then the intermediates are reproduction masters, so they're the next best copy of the film that we have, and that can be sent out to vendors. There are a lot of documentary filmmakers who use the records of the National Archives, and through the vendor system, they can get a very good transfer and if you were to turn on cable television right now, you could probably find a channel that was playing something from our holdings. Um, the third level is the reference copy, and that's if we have an extra print, we can deliver it in the research room to any researcher who is interested. Um, and you can see we designate it with red, yellow, green. It's kind of like a stoplight. And we go from something looking like this is what it was when it first came in, to this. And you can see everything marked preservation, intermediate, or reference. And we physically separate the films so that each one can be stored in the proper storage environment. The preservation elements are sent off site, and the color films are put into a freezer to prevent color fading and other chemical deterioration. Um, the reference copies are kept just down the hall from the research room at A2 out in College Park. So if you, were in t if you would come in to see something where we do have that film copy, you could request it and see it that same day. And 
our numbers on this project are current through mid-February, and this picture up here is actually the very last little bit of inspection work that we need to do with DIVIC. So we are so close to being done. Um, so far we've gone through 1,999 distinct film titles, and we have kept almost 7,000 reels out of the 13,000 that we started with. And of course that's over 5 million feet, which is a lot of winding through the film. <laughs> And we did not keep everything, because 7,000 is not, it's only about halfway to 13,000. Um, we retained the best material that we have for the preservation and intermediate copies and discarded the extra prints. And we have to do this because, of course, we have limited storage space in the stacks. And when you consider that for a lot of the items we have, we only have a single copy, if we can get three copies in the preservation, intermediate, and reference set were pretty well covered. Um, sometimes agencies ask for extra copies to be returned to them, but for the most part, um, once we've done this and um, assigned the sets, we can be pretty sure that it will be preserved. Um, we also discard some elements that are extremely deteriorated. In such a case, we would do photochemical preservation, print a new copy, and discard the vinegared or um, acetate films start to break down into acetic acid, which is vinegar, of course, and that can spread from reel to reel, so you really want to segregate it from the rest of the collection. And this is kind of an example of what it can do. It really messed up the inside of that can, so you don't want it spreading anywhere else. Um, so now I'm going to give it back to Audrey, and she can tell you how to get access to the collection. Um, also, I would say if you go to our table, we have a little piece of extremely vinegared film that if you touch it, it's so brittle that it just falls apart. So if you want to go destroy something, now's your chance. Uh, so we did emphasize that this is about making things available to the public. So the question would be, well, how can we find out about it? Right now, 1,800 of the film and video titles are already in ARC. That's all of the Army and Air Force. They were the larger chunk of the titles that came from DIVIC. And as soon as we finish that little bit you saw on the table, the archival unit will start getting the rest of the descriptions into ARC and everything will be um, described in ARC, every one of those titles, 2,700 altogether. If you want to view it, you do have to come to the research room in College Park. Right now, there are about 730 titles with reference prints. That's what came from DIVIC, so about a third of them. You could just go to the research room and ask to see them, and you can view it on a flatbed viewer. For the titles that don't have reference copies, you can request that a DVD be made. There's a bit more of lag time on that because it does take, there's labor involved and it has to work through our, our queue, but everything is available. And for today, if you stay after the questions period during the break, we'll be showing you what we think is the most awesome title we've ever encountered at the National Archives. It's a 1967 film that was produced by the military to teach proper dating etiquette, and it's called How to Succeed with Brunettes. It's just as awesome as it sounds. I mean, it's not the most historically important film, but it's, it's definitely awesome. So if you want to know more, you can go find a video we made last year called Out of the Dark, Bringing Films to Light at the National Archives. That shows some of our, our other processes in action. You can find it on YouTube. If you just go to the main search box and type in Out of the Dark and National Archives, it's you should, it's the first one that'll come up. Or come ask us anything at our table just outside. Do we have any questions? Hello. Oh, yes. okay. Hi. Are there any copyright restrictions on the film for the ones that the uh, government uh, produce? And, um, for the sponsor? most part, it's generally understood that things produced by the government don't have copyright restrictions. But because, I mean, if there was a presentation given by the general counsel last year that explained that sometimes there's music used in them or sometimes they, use, they outsource some of the production material are some of the production processes, and there can be issues there. There are production files. Military was fantastic. They kept great records. And there are production files that you can look at for the edited films, and there's often information in there. But it takes a little more work to make sure it's OK. All of the unedited footage, you know, any of that, you know, the, the jungle in Vietnam or the World War II footage, you know, that's all raw, that's 
for the most part, is produced by the military. It's silent. You're, you can use that however you want. We did look at the production file for, for the film we're showing you right now, and as far as we could tell, there, were, there was information saying that it was all okay to use as long as it's not for profit. Um, and so we're, we're hoping to get it put up on YouTube since we know it's totally clear. But yeah, it's always very tricky. You can't just assume that it's, it's not under copyright. It takes a little bit of research. Hi. Um, could you explain what exactly is the difference between film and video? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I very specifically meant to mention this because those terms are used interchangeably all the time. People will use their iPhone and record something and say that they're filming it, um, but that's not filming it. That's recording it. Film is a photochemical, you know, motion picture film is a photochemical format. So if you had, you know, People don't have them anymore, but if you had a camera that used to have film in it and you got those negatives back, that's a piece of film and you can look at it and see, I mean, in negative, you might not be able to see exactly the way it should look, but it's a physical image that you can see as long as you hold it up to light, whereas video would be like your VHS cassettes that if people used to have those, it's an electronic record that you, you, know, you need another machine in order to be able to see it on a screen somewhere else. If you pulled the tape out of that cartridge, you you don't have anything. You can't see anything of what the, the record would be. Sorry, I meant to explain that. Yeah, basically it's eye-readable versus machine-readable. We do. Um, that's not in our general mandate, but there are very specifically, if you've ever heard of the Universal Newsreel Collection, there's a question, a copyright question for you, that they were given... so. Newsreel collections are actually really valuable now for stock footage purposes, but Universal didn't realize before they gave their entire collection to the National Archives free and clear that it would, within 10 years it would be extremely valuable. It's all completely in the public domain, and as Heidi had said, if any point in time you turn on the TV and you'll probably see National Archives footage, if it's not military, it's probably from the Universal Newsreel collection because it does go... From, it goes up through the mid-1960s, and it's beautiful footage. It's all in the public domain. We have some smaller bits of other newsreel collections, things like the March of Time and um, a little bit of Paramount. Um, we ended up with those for different reasons, and those are not in the public domain. So if anyone wanted to use those for anything, they'd have to pay for those rights through, you know, they'd have to figure that out and figure out where they have to pay for the rights to use those. There are no more questions. Um, we can watch... Um, something Excellent. magical. And Thank you, can you very much. You. You don't, I'm not going to make anyone watch this film, but it's but awesome. It's, it's worth it.